Imagine if you have the husband going, I'm just going to spend time with God. And I'm going to become more loving. I'm going to, I'm going to have more joy. I'm going to be more kind. I'm going to be more patient. And then you got a wife going, no, I've been spending time with God. I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be more kind. I'm going to be more patient. That's going to be a tough marriage to break up. You know what I'm saying? One of the best things we could do for our marriages, I'm telling you, is start spending some time with God and let him start to give you some of those fruits of the Spirit. We're finishing up this series on relationships. If you're taking notes, today's called Marriage Built to Last. Marriage built to last. And, and listen, um, we'll, I just want to say this up top. Um, Jill and I would never consider ourselves experts by any means. Um, in fact, for a long time, we never wanted to talk about marriage because we're always like, man, we need someone to talk to us about marriage. Um, but, you know, we blinked and we've now been married 25 years. And so, um, yeah, we got married when we were 16, 12. And... Um, and so, no, but we, we love God, we love his word, we love you, yeah. and, um, and believe it or not, we love being married. Yeah. And so uh, we're excited to talk about this stuff. Someone said the other day, they're like, how, how, how's that work? How'd you, 25 years, that's crazy. So some of you, it's like, you're just getting started, kids, right? But for some of you, it's like, man, that's big. And I was like, I couldn't, I didn't have any like great answer. I was like, I don't know. I mean, look at her. That's why, you know, she's amazing. And, uh, and, then, and then something hit me this week. I was like, I got it. I got it. Um, Thursday night, we sat down to watch a movie, and James texted me, and he's like, hey, I got a movie you should watch, and he said we should watch this movie. Go ahead and put that up, and now I don't endorse this movie. It probably has swear words in it. That's a James thing, but um, <laughs> no, the truth is I watched that trailer, and he took out like 10 dudes and blew up a building in the trailer. I was like, oh, this is for me, and then Jill was like, well, I also have an idea. We could watch Mean Girls, and then we watched that trailer, and um, they sing through that movie. That's what they do in that movie. And, uh, you know, but you know what we watched? Mean Girls. That's how you stay married for 25 years. Oh, well, we Let's watched, close in prayer. We, we, I shut the movie <laughs> off after four songs because I knew four oh, long he, can't, songs. he can't do this. He can't handle it. So we, we, he, we watched half of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It should be illegal to call that a movie because they sing. So... Um, so so we, uh, we threw out on social media the opportunity for you guys to put questions in for this weekend, and so we took some of the questions that seemed to, um, you know, have a lot in common and, and, and the ones that seemed to have the most just numbers of people asking for them, and so we're going to do our best to talk about some of these from a biblical perspective today, so let's hop right into it. You ready? Ready. You ready? You ready? Okay, okay, okay. Question number one. What's one thing you would say is important for a healthy marriage? Um, I'm going to say something that, that James threw out at the very beginning of this series. Um, it, it's a book that I had to actually read when I was an intern eons ago. It's called The Five Love Languages. Would you just throw those up real quick on the side screen? Um, many of you have probably heard about these five love languages and, you know, it's pretty simple. Words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, physical touch. Generally, what happens is, is as you look at these, you'll sort of go, you'll identify with two or three, like, that's how I most feel loved. Our temptation as married people is, I'm going to show love the way I most feel love. The problem is your spouse might be speaking a different language, and the wires get crossed, and you're trying to say, I love you, and they're not picking up on the signal. I'll show you what I mean. Put me and Jill's up there for a sec. All right, so, so I'm physical touch. Keep it clean, guys. <laughs> Holding hands, you know what I'm saying? Gifts and words of affirmation. I'm, I don't know which one, I'm two or, two or three, but th those, those two are probably the same, you think, babe? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Jill's acts of service. She's like, I don't want you to buy me anything, just like do the dishes. <laughs> um, words of affirmation and, and then quality time. And so, you know, you think like, oh, this is simple. But my, here's my challenge. My challenge is this week, don't just figure out what yours are if you already haven't. Don't just figure out what your spouses are. Do that if you haven't. But then I dare you to start making a list. Like, here's my spouse's love languages. Here's a list of some real practical things I can do this week to make sure I'm speaking her language or his language when I'm trying to say I love you. Because if you don't, you try to say I love you, and, and it just doesn't, it doesn't land. Um, I'll give you an example. Ten years into marriage, it's my birthday, okay? I'm a gifts person. I love them. 
I don't just like getting stuff. I love giving them. Like the whole thing to me is, you know, when I think of a gift, it's like, well, somebody had, they had to think about me before they bought that. And they, they sacrificed to buy that. And that took time. And, and, you know, it's just, to me, it shows love, right? So it's my birthday. And Jill's like, I got you something. And I'm like, I can't wait. And she's like, well, it's a surprise. I'm like, I love surprises. This is amazing. I'm like, where are we going? She goes, I can't tell you. Just go get dressed and get in the car. So we're driving, and we're driving for a while. And I'm like, babe, where are we going? This is awesome. She's like, oh, you're going to love this. This is good. We pull up to Cabela's. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I just heard an amen down here. I was a hunter for two years, and, and I haven't been back. And it's sad, but for two years, I was all in. And so anyways, we go to Cabela's, and we walk in, and I'm like, babe, what are we about to do in here? And she goes, remember that gift card your friends got you to Cabela's at Christmas? And I went, yeah. She goes, we're going to use that and get you a gun safe today and have it shipped to our house. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I know I'm slow sometimes, babe. I thought you said your gift to me was a gift card my friends gave me at Christmas. <laughs> Is that... See, but see, acts of service, her idea of love was, I'm gonna help him get it and get it shipped to the house. I'm a gift giver. I'm like, she got me nothing. We didn't talk the whole way to the restaurant. You ever go to eat a, eat, eat a special meal with a bunch of friends and pretend you like your spouse the whole time? We did that the whole night. It was bad. Like, it just, was bad. Right? It was bad. And the funny thing is, I was like, well, honey, I, my, I, I was getting this done for you. You weren't getting it done, so I thought I was helping you by getting it done. And he goes, Jill, you didn't even get it done. It's, it's like getting it done is having it at the house. <laughs> it's, I, fine, I, it's fine. It's fine. It's in the past, I wanted babe. you to pick it out. We, counseling you know? has got us through that. So, but no, like, it's real. Like, so one of our first Valentine's Days, right, I'm gifts and physical touch. So I come in with a little gift and thinking we're going to make out. It's Valentine's Day. And she's like, in her mind, she's like, oh, I think you should pick up your shoes off the floor. Let's talk about feelings and watch Titanic. And we were just like, right? Just it wasn't, it wasn't a good Valentine's Day at all. Like we were just on totally different pages. But see, 25 years later, we start trying to speak each other's love language on purpose. Now we're starting to get this thing dialed in. So this past Valentine's Day, and I know some of you aren't Valentine's Day people. But one of my friends was like, I hate Valentine's Day. I'm not gonna be told when to be romantic. And she's like, I tell my husband, let's go out on the 13th. We're doing nothing on the 14th. You can buy me half price chocolate on the 15th. <laughs> but we love Valentine's Day. We, because we're become, yes. we've become yes. one. We, and so yeah. Jill loves Valentine's Day. So, um, so this Valentine's Day, I took a plastic table out of my son's bedroom because he's away at college, and he had a video game set up on it. Sorry, Austin. And I put, a, I put a tablecloth on it, and I got some flowers, and I got some candles, and I built a little one-table restaurant yeah. in our house to surprise Jill with. You guys didn't know I had that in me, did you? <laughs> in fact, I didn't think you, was gonna, you, you would believe me, so I took a video of it before I invited Jill up there. <laughs> Come on now. Did good. Did good. Hey. I had to Google how to put rose petals on the table because I tried to do it and it looked like a red leopard by the time I was done. I was like, this is, can't be right. And I Googled it and, and it's kind of romantic. It's, you're supposed to throw them onto the table because it's supposed to look like the wind blew through some roses and the petals just, I just learned some things. No big deal. It's because I care. You know what I mean? So anyways, I said, here, I've done something for you. And then we sat down and I affirmed her with my words and we spent quality time together. And she now knows how to speak my language. She got me a pair of shoes and said, let's make out. And so everybody won and Valentine's Day was a hit. <laughs> but we st you got to speak each other's language. It's so huge. Um, so that's one of my first ones, babe. Yeah, so which and I got to say over the years, Sean really could write a book and call it I, Romantic Remedies or something like that because he's really gotten really good at at making me feel loved in grand ways so thank you honey it was it was good night i'm like also very manly you <laughs> like lift kids tractor right. tires sledgehammers you know <laughs> oh goodness i don't know where to go from here <laughs> babe okay. what's one thing you would say is important for a healthy marriage one thing i would say is important 
is to forgive, forgive, forgive. Even in listening to that story, <laughs> <laughs> expectations aren't met at times, right? That's just normal. It happens. Yeah. Or we say hurtful things or we all have our moments. And so we have to learn to forgive, forgive, forgive. And I, thinking back to a time when Sean and I were actually in marriage counseling, in a marriage counseling session, and the pastor, who he was a counselor and also a pastor, he looked at me and he asked the question, he said, hey, Jill, are you holding any grievances against Sean at all? Meaning, have you been hurt and you're holding on to it? And he has no idea. He said, because, I want you to pay attention to this. He said, when you said I do to Sean, the two of you became one. And then he talked about Matthew 12, 25, which says, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And while the, Jesus was talking to a group of people in a different setting, the, the principle's the same. And what this pastor slash counselor was saying to me, he said, Jill, by you holding on to hurt and grievances, you're not helping Sean at all, and he is not helping you. And you will never move forward because you can't move forward in freedom when you're stuck in unforgiveness. And so, and, and I, as I listened to him, I went, yeah, you're right. And for me personally, it's sometimes easier to just stuff the feelings or ignore what's been hurt because it's so difficult to talk about, right? It's so difficult to work through. And so in that moment, though, I knew we're together, and I want us to be better together, so I have to let him know where he's hurt me. And all throughout scripture, it talks about wives um, respecting your husbands and husbands loving your wives, and it's really hard, and honoring your wife, and it's really hard to do that fully, completely, if one of you has no idea how they've hurt the other. Yeah. And so in that moment, I had to say, okay, Sean, here are some ways that I have been hurt, but then I also had a confession of my own to make. And that, com that confession was this. Those hidden grievances that I had kept from Sean, the hurt, I had actually gone to some of my girlfriends. And I'd shared all the things that hurt me about Sean. And I, I say that because, and I had to apologize because I know that by my going to other people, other girls, not talking to him, that was just a destructive piece to our relationship. And so here's my encouragement to you. When you've been hurt in your marriage, first take that grievance to God because the beauty of having a relationship with God, you can say anything and everything to him and he can handle it. Look at the psalmists. All throughout the psalms, they are real and raw and they say all their feelings a lot to God. So what I learned after post that counseling session, I learned, okay, I need to first and foremost take my grievances to God because I can share everything with him. I don't have to share everything with everyone. You can share everything with God. You don't have to share everything with everyone. God can handle it. And the beauty of taking it to God first is that as you pray, he'll begin to give you discernment. Okay, what battles do we fight? Because if we fight all of the battles, that's hard on our hearts too. It can leave us really critical. But it's in prayer and sharing with God that he gives us discernment. Okay, what's turning into bitterness? What's turning into resentment? What do I need to take to my spouse and talk through? And he gives counsel in those moments when we take it all to him. And now am I saying, so I said, take all your grievances to God first. You don't have to share everything with everyone. Am I saying that means you cannot share with any one person? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is go to God first. As you feel like he's given you wisdom, go to your spouse next. But if there's a season where you're like, I just need to process with someone, that's okay too. That's where you ask the Lord, okay, show me God who. Who in my life can I process with that has some understanding? Who would be a wise counselor? And really, you just need one. Two maybe, but that's where I would encourage you. Be careful with what you share because you're on the same team too. And what had happened for me, it had turned into somewhat of a bit of a bashing session. And I knew it. And I had to go and I had to apologize to Sean, to God, but, and realize too, hey, wait a minute. I, I need to 
break this habit of going to friends with these things too. I need to take my, my grievances, my hurt, my pain, all of it to God because God's actually the one who can help remedy the situation yeah. far better than my friends ever could, right? Yeah. So in this whole line of forgiveness, it's easy to say forgive, forgive, forgive. But how do we actually do that? When it comes to actually forgiving, it's, not, it's, it's easier than said than done. How do we actually do that? So I've learned, and this, this is, yeah, stick with me here. Look at this scripture. It says, Matthew 5, 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, hear me on this. Your spouse is not your enemy. Your spouse is not the one persecuting you. And Jesus was, it was different, different group of people, different setting, different context. However, the principle is still the same. Like there are absolutely days that I feel like I'm, you know, it, it, there are careful, days it feels careful. like we're, I'm living with the enemy, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are days like that in marriage. If we're being honest and real, there are days when we're, not having a good day, we've said hurtful words, or we just let, you know, we're human, right? And so there are days it'll feel like your spouse, it might feel like your spouse is the enemy and persecuting, that's not persecuting you, that's not the case. But my encouragement to you is pray for your spouse. When you've been hurt, again, I say it again, pray for your spouse, take it all to the Lord. Pray blessing over your spouse. I had someone say, and this is terrible, but this is what they said, I, I pray all the time for my spouse. I pray that she'd get hit by a bus. And I went, that's not, that, I don't, that's not that. Pray blessing. Pray, pray blessing over your spouse. Pray peace and joy and, and favor over your spouse. Because the beauty of praying for your spouse, first of all, God says pray. Pray for the one who's hard to live with. Pray. And so as you say, okay, God, I'm going to do that. I'm going to obey what your word says. I'm going to obey that principle to pray for my spouse, blessing, honor, all of it. As I pray, God then does the supernatural to your heart. As you pray, God moves your heart. God, God causes you to look at your spouse through a lens differently. Do you... Begin to look at your spouse through a lens of compassion yeah. and understanding and, tes- and, and, and tenderness. And those angsty wounds, they start to subside over time. But it's a process. And it's a choice to say, God, I see you want me to pray for my spouse. I'm going to pray blessing over my spouse. I'm going to pray that my spouse has meaningful moments with Jesus. And as time goes, you'll see. I promise you, you'll see the Lord do the supernatural healing and the supernatural side of forgiveness in your heart as you go. Yeah. So. yeah, that's good, babe. That's really good. I find, too, that, I don't know if you do, but I, maybe it's what you just said, and I just don't understand things because I'm, but I feel like, like when, if there's something going on and I find myself praying for you, it's harder to stay mad at you yeah. when I've been praying for you. It, it's, it's harder to not want you to win. When I'm, when I'm praying for you. And so yeah. um, I think, too, you know, we're talking about this forgive, forgive, forgive. Uh, just be real aware that um, it's possible to have fake apologies, mm-hmm. and fake apologies don't help reconcile issues. Uh, I think we got too many fake apologies. This is something I used to do a lot. Um, I, I, and I, every now and then I catch myself still doing it. I'm like, stop, that's not an apology. I'll say the words I'm sorry, but actually take no responsibility for what I did. You ever, you ever do that or have someone do that to you, right? I'll say things like, oh, I'm so sorry if you misunderstood my words. Well, I didn't take any responsibility for that. I'm so sorry if you felt that way. It's almost like I'm insulting her with my apology. I'm so sorry that you're not emotionally stable enough to handle what just happened. Like, I'm saying I'm sorry. I take no responsibility. It's a fake apology, Like real apologies are what reconciles us in our relationships. And a real apology is, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? That's a real apology. And then be real careful that we're not doing fake forgiveness. Because fake forgiveness we can do too, which is, oh, I forgive you. But I'm going to bring it up in three weeks again. I'm going to use it for leverage again, right? Like, oh, I forgive you. But then three weeks goes by. And she'll say something, and I'll go, oh, is that really? Because I think we've learned that's not exactly how it always works, is it? 
I mean, the last time we said this, did, right? I've said I forgive you, but I'm still using it for leverage today. I'm still trying to make you pay for it today. That's fake forgiveness. First um, Corinthians 13, talking about love, it does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. And so my challenge to you is, I think some of you, as you, even as some of you, you'll be watching or listening to this today, and I think God's gonna do something in your heart, and you're gonna go, I need to go speak to my spouse about something that either I've hurt them or they've hurt me, and let's do some real repenting and some real forgiving and ask God to do some real miraculous uh, reuniting of our souls, and you know that's possible, right? Sometimes we feel like we're in situations and relationships where it's like, this is impossible, and you gotta keep reminding yourself with, all, uh, with God, all things are possible, yeah. and that includes the relationship I most care about, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and this is a tough question, and we, uh, but I'm, I'm glad we decided to talk about it because honestly, uh, several people asked this question. What do I do if my spouse is not a believer? Yeah. Babe? It's a great question, and I love this question. At first, I want to just say, hey, be encouraged. Be encouraged. The Lord sees you. The Lord hears you. The Lord knows your situation, and he's for you. And I want you to hear that God actually does have a plan for you in that relationship. And so your spouse, honestly, your spouse is blessed because of your relationship with Jesus. Your household, your children, they're blessed because of your relationship with Jesus. I want to read 1 Corinthians seven twelve. It says, now I will speak to the rest of you. Though I do not have a direct command from the Lord, if a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. And so let me explain this for a minute. When Paul wrote this, he was writing to a group of people and the believers in the room essentially believed that, well, because I have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm married to someone who doesn't, then somehow I'm unholy and my children are unholy. And Paul was saying, absolutely, that is not true. It's quite the opposite. And what I love about this verse is it shows the power of God's kindness, the power of his salvation, the power of the yeah. cross. Because by you having a relationship with Jesus, your household, your children, your spouse is blessed. The favor, the protection, the blessing that you see God pour out on you day after day after day, that will flow over into your home, onto your spouse, onto your children. And it's a really beautiful thing that the Lord does for the one who is in a relationship, who married relationship with someone who doesn't share the same faith. God knows it's hard. He knows marriage is wonderful, but marriage is hard too. And he knows that when you are in relationship with someone who, who shares a different faith than you or doesn't believe, he knows that's an, a whole other layer of heart. And he has compassion for you. His grace is sufficient. He'll meet you where you're at. But he know this. He has a plan and a purpose for you in that relationship. And your spouse and your children have the opportunity to see the goodness of God through you, the blessings you receive. Again, flows over onto their lives, and I love that. And I want to also say, if you are married to someone who does not have a relationship with Jesus, enjoy your marriage. You have permission to enjoy. That relationship is a gift. And as you, the Lord wants you to enjoy your marriage. He wants you to live life to the fullest. And he knows that as you live your life to the fullest, in front of your spouse, in front of your children, with, with your people, he knows that that's really attractive and it will be really attractive to your spouse to just enjoy each other and enjoy life together. And I want you to hear this too. It's not your job to save your spouse. You can't do that. That's the Lord's job. Yeah. Your job is to do your best to just stay in relationship with him, and then you let your life shine as a result. I love Matthew 5, 16. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds, that they may see your good deeds, and glorify your Father in heaven. So my encouragement to you, pray for your spouse, 
pray for his or her salvation, enjoy your relationship with them, and let your life, because of Jesus, because of the light he's, he's given you, because of what he's done in your, your life, let your life shine in front of the one, one you're doing life with and enjoy, enjoy life together and watch and see what God will do in time. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Hey, let me just say this. Um, we're gonna hit another question, um, but I want to, I, we, we are very aware that we can just sort of scratch the surface of a few questions in one service like this. And we know that a lot of you are like, man, I wish we had a tool or a good resource where we could work on our marriage, take our marriage to the next level. Well, would you guys put that slide up? Because in October, we are having our devoted marriage conference, October 25 and 26, and you can pre-register for that bad boy today. Spots are limited, so I'd start registering early. But man, we're gonna have a great time. We're gonna spend a Friday evening and, and a good chunk of Saturday just talking about how to take our marriages to the next level. And so we invite you to that and uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, okay, babe, question number three. What's one thing you've learned about dealing with conflict and or communication? And I know that we don't have this issue, you know, like a lot of couples. Um, I mean, can you imagine if you did a talk on marriage at a church service on a Saturday night and then went home and got in a fight? Like, can you imagine how crazy that would be? It'd be crazy. I can only imagine. Yeah, but some people, believe it or not, have conflict. So um, can, you, can you talk about that? Oh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last night we were like, okay, get the notes out. How do we get through this? Uh... <laughs> oh, okay. Um, my best encouragement, it's, it's plain, it's simple. But my best encouragement is to do your best to lead with kindness. Lead the conversation with kindness. Because look at Proverbs 15.1. It says, a soft and gentle and thoughtful answer turns away wrath but harsh and painful and careless words stir up anger. And I have seen that up close and personal play out because there are just moments where you feel like, I have felt like saying you know, whatever I wanna say because I'm just so upset. And it, I have learned in time that when a conversation, a hard conversation or conflict is approached with kindness, it changes things. And I've noticed that I'm better heard Sean hears me better. He, he hears me and I hear him better when the whole conversation is, is rooted in kindness. I mean, think too, like the way God leads us to him, the way God leads people to repentance is through his kindness. His kindness draws us in. And I have, again, found when he is upset but working really hard to be kind, I'm much more willing to go, Oh, okay. You know what? And I, I'm going to lay down my right to be right because I love you. I see you love and respect me. And so I'm going to do my best to, to grow and, and to, get, to, to, to get to grow in whatever it is, whatever area that we're having conflict over. And we've heard, again, the reason for kindness, another reason, is our words can wound there's power of life and death in the tongue. And I've learned that words can wound or words can give wings to the one that we're married to. Because think about this. So when you say I do, something, again, supernatural happens. Two become one flesh. And so in that supernatural interaction, somehow our words carry more weight suddenly in our spouse's life than any other human on the planet. I'm not saying our words carry more weight than God's words. God's word always carries, carries the most weight in our lives. And if we are struggling with something in the relationship where we ourselves are struggling with hurt or insecurity, go to God's word and see what God word, God's word says about you. But then in the life of your spouse, like my words... <clears throat> If I wound him, it, it does more than if anyone else were to say that hurtful thing, and I've seen it. But in, on the other side, if I encourage him, my words have so much more power to encourage, encourage him and give him word, wings, so to speak, more than anybody else. And again, when you choose to walk in kindness, it just eliminates a whole nother layer of remorse and regret that you would have to work through additionally. So that's where I say, do your best to say, God, 
help me put a guard on my tongue and to look at this conversation and this conflict with kindness, to treat my, my spouse with kindness because it matters and it does carry a powerful punch, no pun intended, so, yeah. <laughs> um, this wasn't originally in my notes, but I just want to say this, one, because I mean it, but two, because I hope it encourages you guys. Um, I can say wholeheartedly, um, I don't think I'm still here doing this job if it weren't for, um, obviously, the power of God, but secondly, um, the way you have supported me and spoke life into me and believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And you really can change the direction of your spouse's life with your words. You change the way they experience life with your words. And um, I think the goal for all of us should be that our spouse would say, behind our backs, I'm better because of how my spouse builds me up with their words. I'm stronger, I have more faith, I'm bolder, right? I'm more confident in life because of the way my spouse talks to me. I think that should be the goal. So um, thank you, babe, I love, I love you. you. Um, question number three, what is one thing you've learned about dealing with, oh, same question. <laughs> uh, conflict and or communication, and then I'm supposed to say something. Now I know where we're at. Okay, understand, here's mine, understand how your spouse communicates. Um, what I mean by this is this is something we just, I don't know, gosh, Harb talked to us, what, this last year or so about this? Um, we felt like we were just missing. Like, you don't understand. No, you don't understand. Well, I'm trying to explain. Well, I don't get it. Well, and I know none of you know what that's like. But um, so he's, we're both in this counseling session, and I can't recommend good Christian counseling enough. Yeah. We're both in this counseling session, and Harv goes, um, can I just point out something that I've recognized? And we're like, yeah. And, he's, and so he's like, Sean, Jill is an internal processor. And so before she speaks, there's a whole lot of things spinning in there. And she's thinking things like, how will my words be received? And how will anyone else that overhears these words in the room receive them? And what's the consequences of these words? And I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this yet. And he's like, you're not. You're an external processor. You're deciding what you're gonna say as you're talking. And so he's like, so here's what happened. And this is what was happening. I'd say something to her or I'd ask her a question and she'd go like this. And I'm like, oh, you don't care. You don't even care. You won't even say anything. Oh, that's obviously a no. You could have just said no. You don't have to be silent about it. I get it. That's not where you wanna go tonight. Fine, just say it. She's just processing. But on the flip side, <laughs> I'll say things that are crazy because I'm saying them as I'm thinking them. Like, I'll say them and go, I, I, I'm just hearing that for the first time too. And, <laughs> and Harv's like, so, so Jill, because he just thinks and talks all at once, there's gonna be times when he says really dumb things. And, and what you might wanna do is don't take them all quite so personal because he's just coming up with a thought as he's speaking. You might wanna do this every now and then. Hey, babe, I know you're processing as you're speaking. Is that really what you meant? or you wanna try that again? Yeah. You know, take two on that one? And it's actually been really good because I'll say some stupid crap and then she'll like, is that what you meant? I'm like, now that I hear it, no, that's not what I meant. But I also now understand that her silence isn't necessarily a negative thing, it's her processing yeah. what she wants to say. And just, man, that'll help. That, just, that kind of stuff is so good. So just work really hard to understand your spouse, little bit more than you try to get them to understand you. I Which, think that I One funny quick story. So when we were dating, we had gotten into an argument over something and I couldn't get my words out. I didn't know exactly what I was feeling and couldn't say it. So I went and wrote in like a journal everything I wanted to say to him and came back to him and read it to him. And he was like, and I, I, he, 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 he was not happy. Why? Because he, I just felt so fake. Yeah, yeah. He didn't feel like I was being sincere, and so it's like I remember read me an argument. I'm like, what is happening right now? <laughs> That's exactly what I did, and so I remember. I didn't say it to him, but as as he's you know upset because I'm reading to him what I'm feeling. I I remember thinking, well, fine. Next time, I'm just going to memorize my lines. <laughs> <laughs> I was so mad, and he was so mad, and. Here we are 25 years <laughs> later, which goes to our next. Oh, what is something we can do to strengthen our marriage? How much time we got? Okay, I'm gonna hit two things. I'm gonna hit them quick because I'd rather them hear from you anyways. 
I'm gonna say this, if you're taking notes, spend time with God and don't stop dating. Yeah. Uh, those two things right there, man, can strengthen a marriage no matter how long you've been married. Yeah. Um, the first one, spend time with God. Um, God talks about how he's the vine and we're the branches, and he's like, man, you, you can't produce any good fruit in your life if you're not connected to me. And the fruit that he's talking about is explained to us in Galatians 5, uh, it's, they call the Holy Spirit's fruits of the Spirit. It says this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Th these are the words that describe us the more we spend time with God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Imagine if you have the husband going, I'm just gonna spend time with God and I'm gonna become more loving. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have more joy. I'm gonna be more kind, I'm gonna be more patient. And then you got a wife going, no, I've been spending time with God, I'm gonna be more loving, yeah. I'm gonna be more kind, I'm gonna be more patient. That's gonna be a tough marriage to break yeah. up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. One of the best things we could do for our marriages, I'm telling you, is start spending some time with God and let him start to give you some of those fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. All right, and number two, don't stop dating. I can't tell you how many people I watch, and they, they're, they're the most romantic people you've ever seen in your life. Uh, to, to get someone and then they get married and it's like they just hit the pause button. It's like, ah, oh, we're, we're married, finish line. Get fat now. <laughs> hey babe, you wanna grab me the Doritos? Like, I don't know why I'm doing that. Um, <laughs> man, we, we're supposed to keep pursuing. That's what like keeps the love and the feelings going, right? Because love is a decision, not a feeling. But, but you, you wanna pour that stuff in after uh, you get married. In fact, Genesis 2.24 says this, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they both shall be one flesh. It's interesting, that, that word cleave in the Hebrew is debak. Listen to this definition, to retain proximity. I'm, I'm trying to keep close. To, to uh, retain loyalty and affection to continue to pursue closely. God's plan was never be super romantic, get her or him to fall in love, date, engage, get married, and then just, eh, we're good. And just assume that the marriage is gonna just keep getting better. When we get together, we're supposed to start pursuing at that point like we never have before. Keep being romantic. Keep showing up with some surprise flowers when it's not Valentine's Day and some surprise dates and speaking your spouse's love language, but man, we just gotta keep dating. Uh, I love what Pastor Craig said. He said, walking away from a marriage because you ran out of love is like selling a car because it ran out of gas. You don't get rid of it, you fill it back up. Some of you, I just wanna challenge you, man. Um, what if this week you decided, I'm gonna start pursuing my spouse again? And, and we had a lot of questions that were uh, revolved around um, children, and, and sort of uh, couples with new children and, and young parents. And I would just say this, I get it and you're busy and you're tired and your whole schedule just changed. It doesn't matter, no more excuses, date that week too. Keep dating your spouse no matter what's happening. Uh, spouse has gotta come before the kids, amen? Just got to. All right, babe, your turn, I'll shut up. No, this is all so good. And I, my encouragement is, hey, do you just decide not to quit. Decide, I am not going to quit. When you, on your wedding day, you took vows that said, included the words in some form or fashion, that I take you for better, for worse. Mm -hmm. And marriage is a wonderful thing, and there will be many better days, and there will be many worse days. Mm -hmm. But my encouragement to you is, on the worst days, remind yourself, okay, this day will pass. This season will will pass because first and foremost, we are committed to Christ, we're committed to each other, we're committed to growth, and therefore we can expect and believe growth will come, a better day will come, a better season will come. It feels hard today, it feels hopeless today, but it will not always feel that hard. It will not always be that hard or feel that hopeless. A better day is coming to you as a married couple because you are better together. And I did, Something I want you to address that I, we hadn't talked about yet. We are talking normal, like, everyday married things. If you oh, yeah, are, yeah. We, yeah, you take that because I well, feel like you say it better. Well, 
when she says decide not to quit, we were just talking about this this week. What we're not saying is stay in an abusive relationship. Right. We're talking about some other husband wife things where you just, I don't feel like we were getting along and you don't love me and I don't feel. If you're being abused, we're not saying decide not to quit. We're saying call the cops and get out of that because God has better for you mm -hmm. until, until that person is either restored or, but we're not saying stay in an abusive relationship. Right. So I just wanna make that clear in case that's you and you're going, well, Jill said decide not to quit. So you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So enough said. Go ahead, babe. And something small I had done years ago when we were in a really tough season, I needed to remind myself of how I felt the day Sean proposed. The day he proposed, I was on cloud nine, right? That's, that's how it happens for all of us, most of us, like on our engagement day. I would say cloud seven. You would say I, I was Well, on because I cried and you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, I was I'm on, just saying. My, my cloud nine looks different than you. Okay, okay, nine. I'll take. I'm an internal. It all stays in here, but it's there. I promise. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, but I'm on cloud nine, and we were in a season of our married life that was really, really tough. To where we were like, are we going to make it? And so something that I had done, and I share this with you because maybe it'll help you too, to stir up those feelings, to remind you of the one you chose, and to remind you of the love you felt on the day that person said, I want you to be my person. I took my wedding ring off, but I left my engagement ring on. Because I can remember right after he proposed and we got engaged, I would look at my hand all the time and I'd see that ring, that simple engagement ring, and I'd get so excited because I was marrying the man of my dreams. And so my encouragement to you, you, you know, you're married. Great days will come, hard days will come. And on the hard days, hard seasons, if you need something to stir up that, those feelings again, maybe for you girls, you could take off your wedding ring, just keep your engagement ring on to remind yourself of those feelings. Guys, maybe you can find an old card or a love note or something that your, love, your wife gave you long ago when you got engaged to stir up the reminder of, oh wait, I know who that person is and I love that person and I'm choosing to stay committed to that person because we are better together and we can and we will enjoy our marriage while keeping it. And yeah, yeah. I, you want me to keep going or should uh, I? Yeah. I mean, what do we got here? Yeah, we're, I think we probably sh should wrap this up. Let me just say this. Um, sometimes in the moment you decide not to give up but I would encourage every single one of you married people and those of you who plan to get married that um, decide before it gets really hard that you're not gonna give yeah, up. So good. Because life happens. Life happens in ways you just won't see coming. Yeah. And um, I can't tell you what it's meant to me. The, there's been two times specifically in my life where I went, I'm not the man I wanna be, I'm not the husband I wanna be, I'm not what you deserve, you deserve better. One was when I was in counseling for anxiety and I couldn't stop having panic attacks and I couldn't get my head on straight. And, and I looked at her one day and she said, she, she said, I know you're gonna get better. And I was like, yeah, but what if I don't? And without hesitation, she said, I'm not going anywhere. And, and I, but I, I knew it, like she had decided before I was going through that, that she wasn't going anywhere. When I got my, my brain diagnosis, I sat in the, car with her um, in the parking lot afterwards and one of the things I was so sad about was I said, I said I don't know how this is gonna affect you long term I don't know how this is maybe this is gonna rob you of some of the things that you deserve to have in a husband at some point without hesitation she looked at me and she said I'm not going anywhere you want to decide I'm not giving up on this thing before life gets hard and uh, you could do that. And so um, yeah. thank you for you. the way you've done that for me. I love you. Um, love your spouse the way you feel loved, of the way they'll feel loved. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Understand how your spouse communicates and get help when needed. Spend time with God. Don't stop dating. Refuse to quit. What else did I miss? I think that's it. Yeah. You can do this, guys. You can do this marriage, you can enjoy your marriage, you can do it well. You're not married to your enemy. The enemy is the enemy and would love nothing more than to separate and to divide you, but he does not win. And you wanna know why? 
Romans 8, 31. I want you to hold on to this. It says, what then shall we say to all of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So where the enemy would love nothing more than to disrupt your married life, he doesn't win because God is for you. You have the spirit of God inside of you. And because of that, no one, nothing can stand against you as a married couple. And so we're going to close in prayer. I'm going to close in prayer. And as I pray, I'm going to have, I want you, if you're sitting next to your spouse, I want you to grab your spouse's hand and hold your spouse's hand as we pray. But then I'm also going to give everyone a moment in here as I pray. I'll ask you to close your eyes, but if you're in this place and you say, you know what, I do not at this time have a relationship with Jesus. So if you're in the room, if you're listening online anywhere, if you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to give you a moment in the middle of our prayer to raise your hand and say, I want Jesus to be part of my life. And quite honestly, the best success you'll ever have in your marriage is with Jesus as the, as the foundation of your relationship. So let's pray. And, and just know, church, we love you. We're for you. We're for you as a married couple. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for every single person in the room, every single person listening online. I thank you, God, that you are for them and not against them. I pray, God, that you would strengthen and solidify every marriage in the room. I pray that you would give your people a, res a resolve, a resolve to remain in relationship with you and a resolve to remain in relationship with each other. I pray that their, their marriages would be blessed. I pray that strongholds would be broken. I pray that we would experience breakthrough as married couples, breakthrough in communication. God, give us wisdom. Give us discernment. I pray for our children, that our children would catch the fire of the Holy Spirit and that their lives would be blessed because we have said I choose Jesus and I choose the one I've married to now and forever and Jesus I pray that I thank you just bless generation upon generation upon generation in this room online across the world that you, your light will shine in this dark world that your light would shine brightly and now God for any who would like to give their life to you in personal relationship I pray for them if you're in the room or listening online and you say I want a relationship with Jesus raise your hand God, I pray for those who just said, Jesus, I want you. God, teach them what it is to do life with you. Put people, believers in their path that will help them navigate this journey. Your word is, um, uh, I pray that your word would come alive in their lives. I pray for your supernatural protection and provision over them. And every single one in this room, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Church, we love you. Let's worship.